The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, well, I'm John Rose, and I'm here sort of with the Fedora Project, although I'm not exactly speaking on behalf of the Fedora Project today. Uh, well, I am, but not in this talk so much. Uh, I've been thinking a lot lately uh, about things like where stuff comes from. Uh, I'm especially interested in where innovative technologies come from. Uh, the project I work with sort of prides itself on uh, leading and developing uh, new innovative technologies. And, uh, you know, thinking about that in terms of governance, um, I'm curious about uh, what sort of things go into an, creating an environment where innovative stuff can happen. So one of the things that's interesting about our world today is that as we look around at virtually anything we have, um, it's really quite a wondrous thing, right? Whether it's a cell phone or an automobile or an air conditioner, a microwave oven, just all the stuff around us, this hotel, um, it's a fantastic, uh, would have been unthinkable uh, not that long ago in history. And one of the things that um, people have noticed for a long time is that as this mass of stuff has accumulated around us, we've stopped wondering so much. Um, and I think, I think there's a, a reason for that, which maybe we'll get to at the end of the talk. I did, I guess as most of you know, if you read the synopsis of this uh, talk, it's going to uh, largely be about pencils and to make sure that at least you get something out of the talk. I, I brought some pencils. There's a second reason for that. Sometimes when I give this talk, uh, there are young people and they don't really use pencils anymore. So we'll make sure everybody knows what a pencil looks like. So back in the 1950s, there was a a uh, libertarian thinker named Leonard Reed who wrote a, an interesting essay called I Pencil. And he, he wrote the history of a pencil or the life story of a pencil in the first person uh, as if it was the pencil telling the story. And from that he drew some conclusions and made some observations and I'm going to share roughly what those were with you today. So I don't have a pencil. I need a prop. So a pencil, I, I, I choose a pencil partly because uh, of the iPencil essay, but also because it's one of the simplest tools that we have available today, right? I mean, it's hard to think of something simpler than a pencil. Um, but if we ask a question like, do we think we could make this pencil ourselves?" we start to run into problems. Even though it's so simple, it's still going to be difficult to make ourselves. So let's look a little bit into what goes into a pencil, uh, just what's needed to construct it. There are only a few things in it. So we have graphite, which is the lead part in the middle. Um, it might not be pure graphite. There might be some extra stuff uh, mushed in there. So it's usually combined with clay or wax and a little bit of chemical stuff to give it a structure that's suitable for a pencil. We have uh, usually cedar wood. Uh, encasing the pencil. Uh, we have an eraser, often made out of some kind of rubbery substance. Uh, we have this metal ferrule that goes around the pencil that's typically made out of aluminum or brass. Uh, there's a few other ingredients, glue, varnish, lots of varnish actually, so the pencil's pretty. If we think about some of these items, I'm not going to go through all of them, but here's a picture from the, the first large deposit of graphite that was found. And this was discovered in Barrowdale, England in about the year 1500. So it's uh, been around for a long time. Uh, and it was just, you know, big chunks of graphite uh, that were suitable 
Uh, they were really nice for pencils because you could saw the graphite into thin strips. Um, and in 1500, pencils weren't made out of wood, so they were wrapped with string or animal hide or something else. So the pencil, the pencil lead wasn't a round strip like it is today. Um, but how do I get this? If I want to do this today, I, I don't live in Barrowdale, England. And even if I did, I probably couldn't just walk over and grab some. <laughs> so I need to somehow get uh, the graphite from somewhere. And here's an example of where it came from in about 1900. So this is a graphite mine in Ceylon, I think. And I don't know, it's difficult to see from a distance, but there's this a scaffolding structure here that goes from the top of the mine clear to the bottom of the mine, mine and there are people <laughs> all the way up and down it. And I, I presume, although I don't know what they're doing on the scaffolding, but I, I presume they're passing the graphite from the bottom of the mine to the top. So in 1900 at least, in order for me to get graphite, I needed the help of all these guys. And if we think about it, it's not just these people that we need the help, help of, uh, because how does the graphite get from that part of the world to the part of the world I'm in? So there's people that make paper, graphite's very messy, comes off on your fingers. So there are people that make paper that you wrap the graphite up in. So you get a block of graphite, you wrap it in paper. There are other people that make string to tie that up. All of those people are contributing to our pencil. Once it gets out of the mine, uh, it has to be put on a ship, transported across oceans. There are lighthouse keepers, tugboats, all sorts of other people involved in getting just one of the core components of this pencil to me. Cedar trees, which are used for most pencils, are found largely in California and Oregon, although there are other places. You could go out in your backyard and find a cedar tree. But even if you did, could you massage it into the shape of a pencil? Uh, that requires some sort of lumber skills, right? You need to be able to cut down the tree or part of the tree. You probably need saws to do that. Uh, you need to form the lumber into some sort of, uh, usually intermediate uh, sort of form, which goes off to a mill. Uh, from there it goes, well, actually in the mill is where it gets put into like two by fours or whatever sheets of, of wood. That would eventually get sent to a pencil factory where it would be refined into the shape of a pencil. Uh, again, we have tons of people involved in getting this wood to me. Just, just a little piece of wood, <laughs> but I can't, I can't go pick it up in my backyard. Uh, the tip, which I mentioned, we usually think of it as being made out of rubber, uh, comes from rubber trees somewhere else in the world. This, this picture, I, I think, is from Thailand. And uh, so some other people need to find these trees. They need to tap them. You'll see little baskets um, on the sides of the tree. Uh, those collect the latex that drips out. Uh, that latex has to be, again, somehow packaged, shipped uh, for our use. Uh, rubber isn't quite enough for the pencil eraser because rubber uh, doesn't actually erase anything. So you have to mix it with pumice or some other kind of abrasive substance um, to get something that actually is useful as an eraser. So again, we have gobs more people involved in making it possible for me to you know, buy this pencil for a few cents. The ferrule is made out of metal, so we have forging involved. How many of us know how to do that? Right? We need to melt down whatever kind of metal we're going to use for this, shape it into the proper structure. Um, another task that's uh, difficult for most people to do, and uh, often is just something none of us know how to do. So some observations about this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip where glue comes from. So <laughs> I'm stopping at the metal work. Uh, but some observations. So one is that uh, the production of this pencil uh, involves millions of people, really. And I mean, I'm only t touching the tip of the iceberg of the people who have a hand in making it possible. Uh, right? All of these people need to be fed when they're working. They drink coffee at work. 
all of that stuff has to be produced other places. All those people are actually helping to make this pencil as well. So an interesting question to me is how does, I mean, this is, we're talking really a massive community of people working to produce a pencil. And how does that community ever get formed? Uh, be, we'll, we'll see that uh, it, it isn't exactly orchestrated from some governing pencil body, right? It's happening outside of, of that. It, it may not quite be spontaneously formed, uh, but it, it forms in a mysterious way. And another interesting thing about this community is it, it's kind of loose and unstructured. So some components of the community may be like, you know, enemies of other portions of the community. So you may have, you know, situations where some of the people producing one part of the pencil would actually just go to war if they <laughs> ran into somebody else also contributing to this pencil. So we get cooperation that kind of goes above uh, national boundaries and tribal rivalries and all of those kinds of things. Um, part of the reason for that is going to be that these people don't know that they're cooperating with each other. So one of the uh, observations that people find uh, most interesting is that no one knows how to make this pencil. I mean, actually, there's just so many different parts, even though there's only like maybe six or eight components to it, nobody knows how to make all those things. There are people who know how to make the metal stuff, and there are people who know how to take care of the lumber aspect of it. There are people that know how to take these parts and put them together into a pencil and actually produce the pencil. But there isn't any single person who knows how to make the whole thing. And if you think about the bigger picture beyond a pencil, all the other seemingly much more complicated things that we have around us. Certainly, no one knows how to make those either. I'm going to come back shortly to what I think is at work that, that, that allows things to come into existence that no one knows how to make. An important point is that it, this isn't uh, some sort of masterminded operation. Nobody in a vacuum at some point back in history said, I think a pencil would be a great idea. I mean, we had sort of people drawing in caves and we had people marking sheep with messy things. Um, but yeah, no one came up and just said, oh, a pencil, that would be a great idea. Now all I need to do is figure out how to get these million other people to cooperate with me to make it possible. It couldn't have ever come into existence that way. So from the chaos of all these other people doing all these different things, uh, a pencil popped out of it, as did your iPhone if you have one, or all the other, your microwave oven, all the other stuff we have around us. To me, maybe the most curious observation about the pencil is that while we have billions of them manufactured and we have millions of people somehow involved in producing them, making them possible, no one is doing that because they want to have a pencil. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, the, the people making the ferrules, that, I mean, they're doing metal work for whatever reasons they have to do metal work. It happens that they do something that's useful to somebody who wants a pencil, uh, but they're not doing it for them. And they're not, certainly not doing it because they want a pencil. Uh, the people cutting down trees in California and Oregon, not because they want pencils. E even if you think about the guy who runs the pencil company, he's not doing what he's doing because he wants a pencil. Right? He's kind of good at business, so he's running a company. Pencil just happens to be what they make. So the takeaway here is that everybody, the millions of people that we've identified as being, you know, having a hand in making pencils possible, they're all doing what they're doing for their own reasons. And we don't know what all those reasons are. Uh, we sort of know abstractly what they are, but we don't know specifically what they are. So I want to make a small digression here, and my digressions sometimes aren't that small. Um, 
There's a guy named Matt Ridley who does a talk called When Ideas Have Sex. And you should go look this guy up. The talk is short, maybe between 15 and 20 minutes. Uh, you, you'll probably want to watch it more than once if you watch it the first time. <laughs> because it's a, a really, really good talk. And uh, he, he looks at the same sort of stuff from a slightly different angle. And uh, his talk kind of begins looking at uh, what happened, asking the question, what, what happened uh, between the Stone Age and now that changed this fact? In the Stone Age, all the stuff you had around you, you made yourself. So you knew everything about it. You knew how to make it. You knew what it was for. Um, today, virtually nothing around us is something that we can make. Most of what's around us, we have no idea how it even works, right? The only thing we know is we can acquire it. We know what purpose it serves. We know that our toaster toasts uh, bread. And so if we, want, if we want toasted bread, we buy a toaster and we use it to toast bread. And when it breaks, we buy another one, right? So, what happened between the Stone Age and now that enabled uh, this proliferation of wealth, all the stuff that we have now versus the two rock tools that we had during the Stone Age? Um, and Matthew, Matt Ridley's uh, contention is that what happened is humans began trading with each other. So exchange came into the picture at the end of the Stone Age. Exchange has uh, some interesting sort of economic properties, and it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Humans are the only animal that's ever exhibited exchange as a method of interacting. Um, somebody, I think, once said something about, you've never seen a dog trade bones with another dog, right? Other animals do cooperate. They do teach each other things, so they teach skills to each other. Uh, but they don't actually build things and trade them. And what humans found at some point was that uh, exchanging items uh, was beneficial economically to both parties. So even if uh, Robin back there and I can make two different things ourselves, and she can make both of them faster than I can, if we split the work up uh, properly, uh, we'll both do less work and end up with the same stuff. And as, as that sort of economic idea took off, and it didn't take off because somebody understood it, it happened probably for other reasons, uh, we started generating a va vast amount of wealth compared to what existed in the world before it. Um, <clears throat> One of the side effects of it, however, is that people specialized in what they do. So rather than being a jack of all trades in your, you know, like cave pad, you uh, became someone who knew how to do this thing really well, because that's what you did. And then you exchanged the, the, the product of that for all the other things you wanted. Um, so people became kind of very focused in their knowledge. And that leads to uh, dispersed knowledge acro across the community. So it's no longer sort of driven by super smart people who have aha moments and just, you know, have some brilliant innovation that pops out of their head. Uh, what instead is happening is lots and lots of people in the community have little bits of knowledge. And somehow something happens that causes that knowledge to coalesce into new things. And that process is what Matt, Matt Ridley is talking about when he talks about ideas having sex. So you get, you get this giant pool of information, and you just let it sort of swish around together, and people will find new ways to put things together uh, out of that sea of seemingly unrelated stuff. So for sort of the big picture here, uh, from my perspective, the key thing that we need to have innovation or new products popping out of this, what, chaos, is for people to have sufficient liberty to pursue whatever it is they want to pursue. 
Um, if you're involved somehow at some level of government or some organizational structure where you uh, have the ability to organize and regulate the activities of other people, uh, if maximizing the kind of you know, availability of pencils and all other kinds of cool stuff that we have is important to you, uh, you should keep this in mind. The community needs to be open in a sense of, when exchange is the underlying basis of, of the knowledge, the community is sort of open by default. Because um, by doing the exchange of, of goods and services, uh, knowledge transfers from one place to another about those uh, goods and services. Uh, in, other, in other parts of uh, of, of culture, it, it just needs to be open so that the information that people can use to create new things can be shared. And, you know, the, if we can't make a pencil today by ourselves, then it's pretty clear we need to cooperate with other people to get much of anything useful done. So, not hoarding knowledge is critical to this working. Chaos is a word I don't really like because I don't really think chaos is involved in what's going on here. Um, what we have is unregulated human action. That is, people are doing things based on their own interests and goals and desires. And that unregulated human action isn't, isn't really chaos, but it looks like it if you're not involved in it. So if you're looking at it from the outside, it just looks like a bunch of people running every direction, doing whatever it is they please. And I often hear, uh, at about this point, I, I, I often hear people ask, you know, well, it sounds like what you're suggesting is we just let people run amok and do whatever the heck it is they want to do, and then out of that pops cool stuff. <laughs> and that, that is kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'd like to put it in a little bit different perspective uh, rather than out of chaos. Um, the, the chaos isn't really what's going on. What, there's an economic term called spontaneous order. And spontaneous order is by definition what, what comes out of human action. And it's, it's not what comes out of human design. It's what comes out of human action. And if we think about that, well, one of the coolest things that's ever happened to human beings is the development of natural language. Where did that come from? Human action, right? People just do it. Um, by interacting uh, with each other, uh, by doing the things they do, they naturally developed some sort of way to communicate with each other. Um, We've tried, I mean, there's no board of directors that said this is the language, this is how it's gonna work. Uh, we have some special languages, like programming languages, that aren't natural. Uh, we don't usually communicate. We sometimes do communicate that way, but most people don't. Uh, there are some artificial languages that humans have tried to create to replace natural languages. Th those have been uh, failures. <coughs> So, it's not out of chaos, but it's out of unregulated human action that things like the pencil pop up. So things I'd like to encourage, and this is a little bit thinking about the consequences of these things in terms of uh, governance bodies, and by governance bodies here, I don't necessarily mean open source project government, governance bodies. It could be, uh, you know, go actual governments at various levels. It could be other sorts of institutions or organizations you, uh, you're involved in. But one of the things I think we should continue to encourage is just for what what I'm, I'm calling contributors here, and that sounds a little bit open source project-ish, but it's, I don't really mean it that way. Anybody who's contributing to whatever sort of organization or society, um, we, we want to continue to encourage them to scratch their own inches, because that's really where innovation and stuff comes from. 
Um, contributors don't have to be individuals. A lot of what I've been talking about makes it sound like I'm only talking about single humans at a time. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, a corporation or uh, a philanthropic organization, those things have their own itches to scratch to. They sort of, as a group, decide what those itches are and then they pursue whatever they think is you know, appropriate to, you know, to facilitate achieving whatever goals they have. So those are contributors also, and they, they should be allowed to scratch their own itches in as unfettered a way as, as possible. Uh, encourage toleration of di difficult contributors. Uh, this one is, in a way, pretty uh, sort of open source community ish because when we think about the, the community that creates the pencil, uh, it doesn't interact in a way. I mean, even though we have like uh, little blocks of animosity between groups of people that are involved in producing the pencil, they don't actually have direct communication with each other. They're probably not even aware that they're both contributing to the existence of the pencil. So uh, they don't really cause problems uh, in the development of pencils. In other sorts of communities, and it's not just open source communities, but in any communities that have sort of direct online communication with a broad group of contributors, uh, we do run into problems with difficult contributors. And I'm being as polite as I can about what, what is a difficult contributor. The typical response I see from organizations is uh, try to get them to change which almost never happens. Uh, and when that doesn't happen, try to get them to go away. And from my perspective, uh, those aren't really, it's fine to try to get them to change. I have no objection to that. Some, some people will come around. Um, trying to get them to go away, I have a problem with, because if they really are contributors, um, they're actually helping us achieve the goals that we want to achieve. And I'd like to find a solution to deal with the problems that they cause that doesn't involve asking them to go away. And so what instead I would like to do is ask the people who aren't difficult contributors to be the ones to take care of the problem. And if you, yeah, I'm sure all of you are members of online communities, all of you have probably seen ridiculous threads pop up in forums or on mailing lists where people just go on and on and on, uh, attacking each other, and it gets very unpleasant. Um, almost always, there are a few sort of instigators. So they seem to be instigators. They're the ones that are always involved in these things. But there's also a bunch of people that are involved in every one of these threads that I've seen who aren't you know, viewed as difficult contributors. They're offended by what the first person said. <laughs> And they want to react to it. They feel they just need to react to it because that person did something bad and you, know, you don't want to endorse it and sitting by silently can be thought of as endorsing it. Um, but I think that's what they should do. You can uh, privately talk to the person, uh, but the non-difficult uh, members of your community uh, should, should basically ignore the difficult member when he says something really nasty. And he won't continue for hundreds of posts if nobody responds to him. The next two points, uh, I'm going to have a couple of slides each uh, to describe my thinking about those. Resource allocation is a hard problem. Uh, it's always going to be a hard problem. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to side with not pretending that I know how best to allocate resources. Um, so, so I'm going to encourage making resources available, even in cases where you think it might not be the best use of resources. Uh, and then often what comes up is, and this is a fair uh, sort of question, uh, some I want to encourage people to follow their own ideas. So I want them to scratch their own itches. That means they have ideas, they want to try them out. Um, and I, I want to encourage them to do that. I want to make it available for them to do that, make resources available for them to do that. 
And I know a lot of those ideas aren't going to pan out right then. Uh, and I know that a complaint that I hear occasionally, and it's a, it's a fair complaint, is that this person has an idea, he wants to try something, but he can't do it all by himself. So he has to ask this person for a little tiny bit of help. <laughs> and that person helps and then doesn't see any result because whatever this person was trying doesn't pan out. And then another person comes along and wants to try something else and also needs this person's help, just a little bit of it. But over time, this sort of accumulates and this person is feeling you know, burdened by all the people asking for a little bit of help. And then they don't see, you know, this person over here doesn't see anything positive coming from any of this. So they get tired of that and they say, well, these people just have bad ideas <laughs> and we shouldn't be, you know, like expending resources and time and energy uh, helping them with their bad ideas. We should just tell them those ideas are bad, do something else. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So what do we do with resources? Well, everybody who's ever had any sort of control over any resources knows that there are times when somebody has to decide, and if you're the one with control, it's going to be you, um, how, to, how to make use of resources. So if we have a resource, we have five units of this resource, uh, this person wants to use those five units for one thing, another person wants to use those five units for something else, we can't let both of them do it. So we have to, somebody has to make a decision. And I'm not really interested so much in that case, because in that case, you, you just have to make a decision. Uh, I am gonna, I, I will say, I think whatever decision you make will be wrong. So just, <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> um, but I'll explain that a little bit. So. Uh, in a lot of cases, though, uh, humans, at least a lot of humans, have a tendency that's probably learned to conserve resources that they have. So you don't want to, you know, end up without being able to feed yourself. So you save for a rainy day. And all of, the, all of that gets ingrained into a lot of us. So even when we have a lot of a resource or we have a renewable resource or we have a resource that... Uh, for a lot of you know, purposes can be thought of as being unlimited, uh, we still tend to try to hoard it a little bit. And if we think somebody wants to use it for some ridiculous thing, uh, we think, well, maybe a couple of years from now, something much more important will come along that will need this, so let's just save it and tell this person no. Um, so I asked the question, what happens when the wrong people decide how to use resources. The answer to that's gonna come in the next two slides. Um, I'll just say that I think no matter what group decides, it's the wrong group of people. And if you think about um, who knows what in this world at this point, there isn't any group of 10 people that has sufficient knowledge about what, whatever it is they're doing uh, to actually make these kinds of decisions intelligently. I mean, they'll do the best they can, but the, the small fraction of knowledge they have about what the actual processes are, what the potential benefits are, is so small that there's really not much hope for good decision making in this area. So I wanna go back to the Borrowdale mine for a minute. Now remember, this was 500 years ago, roughly. And I'm also gonna talk about, uh, this is a, a model of one of the typical GPS uh, satellite servers. So we have, I think, I don't remember. Do we have 24 of those floating around the world? Something like that. These two things have something in common. Even though they happened 500 years apart, and one thing that we learn from this is that we don't usually learn things. Some things we just keep doing over and over and over. Well, let's go back to Borrowdale. Uh, so people found this incredible little robust mine of graphite, and it doesn't take long for people to find new ways to use this kind of stuff, right? We have a new raw material. How can we put it to use? Um, 
Graphite's kind of like a, the highest grade of coal there is, so you can imagine it probably it has lots of uses today. Even then, it wasn't, they didn't like find this and say, aha, we'll make pencils. <laughs> uh, what, they, what they discovered very quickly was that they could improve their cannonballs by lining the mold for the cannonball with graphite. And once that was discovered, uh, the crown decided to put armed guards at this mine so that other people couldn't take the graphite and use it for some other reason. And later on, when they thought, well, there's going to be a period of time here where we don't need more graphite, but we don't want people using it, we don't want to have armed guards, you know, watching it all the time, they just flooded the mine so people couldn't get in and get the graphite. Um, some decades went by where people who really wanted the graphite for things like pencils uh, went ahead and found ingenious ways to steal it from the mine, despite the armed guards and the flooding. Um, but for, I think, well, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 years, uh, this resource was sort of prohibited from civilian use, as best as they could at the time. And we fast forward 500 years, and I'm going to give you my history of satellite GPS stuff. It may be slightly off from the truth, right? I'm not a historian. But uh, the way I understand this happened is in the mid to late 50s, Sputnik was launched. And when Sputnik sent back radio signals to Earth, and a couple of ingenious characters at Johns Hopkins, I think it was Johns Hopkins, uh, asked themselves the question, can we use these radio signals somehow to figure out where Sputnik is in space? And so what they did was uh, they concocted some crazy looking mathematical formulas and they took radio signals and the Doppler effect and combined them and were able to pinpoint where Sputnik was uh, from snooping on the radio signals. They published this, right? Good, open, <laughs> knowledge people that they were. And somebody else with knowledge of another sort of program that maybe wasn't widely known at the time uh, noticed this result and um, was interested in it. So uh, in this case, the US government was working on um, submarine-launched missiles. And while they were working on that, they had a problem. They knew they had a problem, and the problem was if a submarine goes out and sails around the ocean for a couple of months, it's hard for it to launch a missile directed at something when it no longer knows where it is. I mean, it doesn't know where it is. <laughs> it knows where the target is, but it doesn't know where it's launching from. So that was a problem that needed to be solved. And uh, yeah, somebody noticed that this Sputnik research might be related to that problem. So they asked uh, these guys if they could look at the reverse problem. Could we, from space, pinpoint where something was on Earth? And of course, the interest in doing that was they wanted to know where the submarines were so they could launch much more accurate uh, missile strikes. Uh, I don't know, 30 years went by. Uh, these, these researchers got hired into the program to do the research that led to all of this. And over about the next 30 years, this technology, uh, which we now know is immensely useful to humans in general, uh, was unavailable for civilian use. So it was hoarded by another government. Uh, I think in the, well, I know in the early 80s, uh, the then president of the United States uh, declared this technology a public good. And over the next decade or so, um, it was made available for civilian use and commercial use. That was, I think, fully implemented in 1994, so we've had less than 20 years since it was made available to the public. And you can probably, at least people who are older than 20 years old, <laughs> can think of all sorts of amazing uses that this is being put to now. So. Finding Starbucks by touching your phone a few times was not possible uh, 
in 1990. Having your car talk to you and tell you where to turn next uh, to get to this conference hotel was, was not possible then either. So what went wrong here? In both of these cases, 500 years apart, we have governments that hoarded resources that were actually very useful, uh, useful in many, many different products and services that people like to consume. Uh, and what happened was, I'm not gonna question the uh, motivation of either of these governments. Uh, they were acting on, what, the knowledge that they had to make the best decision they thought they could about what to do with the resource they controlled. But the end result is the same over and over and over <laughs> through history when this kind of hoarding takes place. So small, small groups of people, at least since the Stone Age, have such imperfect knowledge about what something is useful for uh, that they really can't make intelligent decisions about what to do with it. Uh, last, last thing I want to talk about is good ideas and bad ideas. Uh, I, often, I often hear that, especially from people who get imposed on by other people's ideas, uh, that we want to promote only the good ideas. And the problem is, yeah, how do you decide what's ahead of time? I mean, until, okay, some ideas seem flaky on the surface, but uh, you don't really know if an idea is good or bad until you try it, and good and bad is a relative judgment thing. So I think when people say bad, what they normally mean is an, an idea is ineffective, right? It doesn't accomplish something now. Uh, lots of ideas, however, accomplish things later in life, right? So they, they sit around in the uh, pot of ideas that Matt Ridley says have sex periodically through history. And they sit around in there and eventually they connect up with other things that lead to good mutations. So here's an example of something that probably most people would think was a bad idea. I mean, you need to know when it happened, but this is like uh, an attempt at a flying machine modeled after a bat. And we, we've probably seen uh, shows on the Discovery Channel and whatnot now where we know uh, enough about the mechanics of bat wings that this is pretty a ludicrous thing to try to do. And even if you didn't know that stuff, uh, it looks kind of crazy. Uh, but if you saw it attempt to fly, which would take about three seconds, we see it go up about a foot and then crash uh, in an ugly fashion, um, you would probably conclude it's a bad idea also. Now, probably everybody here has seen pictures of uh, guys from like, I don't know, the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, with like feathers duct taped to their arms and they're like running off the top of a building or the edge of a cliff. And you know, it just has bad idea written all over it, right? Um, But then there was this idea, which changed the world. And how is it different from those bad ideas we just talked about? It worked, that's the only difference, right? It was the same idea, humans flying. Uh, this one worked, it changed the world, we think it was a great idea. The other ones didn't work, we condemn them as bad ideas. What we don't know is whether this one would have happened without the hundreds or thousands of ridiculous attempts at flight that preceded it. All that failed stuff going into the pot stewed around <laughs> with, uh, you know, this obviously has new technology that wasn't available when those earlier attempts uh, happened. And so that we have a new mixture. And the mixture includes both good and bad things, information that comes from good and bad things. Uh, or I should say good and ineffective things. Uh, I think the guy with the feathers duct taped to his arm had a good idea. It just wasn't the way, the way to implement it. So I'm kind of of the opinion that, I, I will agree that I, I do think there are some bad ideas. The bad ideas from my perspective, and this is a value, again, like I said, it's a value judgment, what makes an idea bad. 
I think bad ideas are the ones that uh, are designed to impede people pursuing their own goals. So uh, government and organization structures that are designed to do the opposite of uh, provide you liberty to pursue your own goals are ideas that I think are bad. Ideas that are not in that realm, though, uh, I think are really mostly just ineffective or effective. Uh, they're, they're, and we call that good or bad. Now, could we skip and do we want to not spend resources on the ones that we're pretty sure are going to fail to start with? Um, well, you might need to do that if you have resource restrictions. But in general, I think it's better to have more stuff in the idea pot, more experience with trying it this way and that way, even if those ways fail. Uh, they make subsequent technology gains easier. Because if you didn't try it the wrong way, somebody else is likely to come along later and try it the wrong way. So back to this quote. Um, the lack of wonder, uh, here's where I think that comes from. I think it's, it's been around for uh, qu quite a long time. Uh, I've mentioned several times that we've, uh, as we left the Stone Age and developed until now, having an exchange-based economic system, uh, or it doesn't even have to be an economic system, but uh, living by exchanging things has led to people specializing. Uh, the knowledge that they have is specialized, compartmentalized. That's resulted in us not understanding the things around us. So if we don't understand the things around us, I don't know how my microwave oven works, I don't know how my, I know what my car's for, right? I, I can drive it, but I don't know how it works. I don't know how to build one. Uh, the same thing's true of my microwave oven. I know what it's supposed to do. I know how to put food in it, punch a few buttons, and get it nuked. Um, but I'm getting things that I can't think about. I can't really spend my time thinking about how they work because it's just not, I know I can't understand how they work. I don't know, I can't understand how they're made, I can't understand, you know. The only thing I can understand is what their purpose is and what I have to do to make that happen, which usually isn't very much. When I get this pencil, it doesn't come with a schematic or instructions, right? I have to figure out how to sharpen the end of it once I've, once I've mastered that, right? It just pretty much, is obvious how to use it. And the same thing's true with microwaves and cars. You have to learn a little bit, and then, then you go. Um, so the, the fact that we don't know how anything around us comes to be or works anymore, I think is one of the reasons that we're lacking in wonder. So I hope, uh, thanks for coming, and I, I'd like to thank Self for inviting me back. Um, are there any questions? Pencils should generate questions. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, thanks for coming. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, 
everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary, everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloud Stack Management Server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, 
uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked.